A building collapse in Florida, prompting calls for change in Kansas City. So who's inspecting high-rises where you live? A shortage of ventilators now ringing alarm bells in Springfield. But what does it mean to us here? Get ready for takeoff as we dissect our biggest local stories and newsmakers straight ahead on Week in Review. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlise Gorley, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes, and thank you for joining us on our weekly journey through the week's most impactful, curious, and befuddling stories making the news in our metro. With us are four people charged with defuddling the news. Is there such a thing? Kat Reed is investigative reporter at 41 Action News. Michael Mahoney is KNBC's chief political reporter. Eric Wesson leads the Call newspaper. And you find Dave Helling in the pages of your Kansas City Star. The collapse of a condo building in Florida continues to dominate the nation's headlines as the death count increases there are still lingering questions over what happened and why now the mayor of Kansas City Quinton Lucas is calling for a review of high-rise buildings in Kansas City the mayor wants to inspect the structural integrity of all city-owned and city lease buildings I think all options are on the table to make sure that we keep people safe and if we're seeing a, a failure in building codes in one part of the country I think it's a sign that maybe there's more work we can do Kat Reed, so right now, are there any inspections of high-rise buildings in Kansas City? Well, there are no routine checks for structural integrity on um, some of these high-rise buildings, but there are periodic inspections of parking garages, caves, and broadcast towers. Um, but they're looking into particular, potentially adding these third-party structural integrity inspections um, to kind of see if, if we could do more periodic inspections. That's what the city manager is tasked with studying. Do I have to say, quite a lot of our viewers very concerned about this issue, including Renee, who emailed me this week. I live on the 10th floor of a 12-story condominium constructed 60 years ago, so it's been on the top of my mind lately, she writes. The mayor's resolution is a start, but many of us hope it extends to all high-rise residential buildings, not just those the city owns or leases. Aren't most high-rise buildings, though, in the city privately owned? And does the mayor have any jurisdiction over those, Dave? Well, theoretically, yes. I mean, there are regulations that any government can enact that require uh, inspections or reinspections for structural integrity, and I think that's what the mayor has in mind. But you raise a good point, Nick, and that is that individual condominium owners, if they want these inspections, can actually go to their condominium board and say, hey, let's do this. I mean, let's see where we're at. You don't have to wait for the government. The question is always not only can you inspect these structures, Nick, but what happens if you find a problem? I mean, do you, it, it, one of the things that was true in Florida is this building that collapsed was facing multi-million dollar repairs because of structural problems that were going to have, that money was going to have to be paid by the people who own those uh, apartments. So, uh, you know, this is a multifaceted concern. Kansas Cityans should know that the city does not routinely inspect homes or condos would take a more concerted and expensive effort to do so. And that's true in other parts of the metro, too. I did notice that Overland Park, for instance, also does not inspect any of its high-rise buildings. But Eric Wesson, at a time when we were saying we want city government to work better for people, um, what's the appetite for having more regulations at this point in time at City Hall? Well, there's probably not an appetite for some more rules and regulations uh, when it comes to inspecting buildings. Uh, people are always complaining about the city giving them tickets for gutters falling off the side of their house or hanging. Uh, then they wind up in housing court paying fines. But Dave brings up an interesting point uh, when it comes to inspecting them and then doing something about it. Because down here on 18th Street, you can remember a couple of months ago, we had a building that had collapsed down the street. They knew that that building wasn't sound probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago, and they never funded fixing that building and then it winds up collapsing. So 
knowing that the building is in bad shape and doing something about it are always two different conversations. But I would say, I, I wonder if the Surfside building collapse is going to be a wake up call for a lot of building owners, because you look, they are already facing litigation down there, um, massive lawsuits, years of litigation to follow. So I do question if maybe some owners will take more proactive action to prevent uh, being in a situation like that. Now, all of this, of course, is taking place as Kansas City is about to mark the 40th anniversary of the Hyatt Regency Hotel hotel disaster. More than 100 died when the hotel skywalks collapsed. It remains the deadliest non-deliberate structural failure in American history and was the deadliest structural collapse in the U.S. until the downing of the World Trade Center towers 20 years later. Apparently, Michael Mahoney, video from the collapse of the Kansas City Hotel have been played over and over again by local news stations in Florida as they try to make sense of the collapse of that condo building in Surfside. But is there a comparison to be made here or are these totally different incidents? I think that there is a comparison to be made because it appears at first blush that there were issues all uh, with uh, A, the construction of that building and B, the inspection process of that in its process. Yeah, just quickly, and I think Michael knows this, the problem at the height was a design flaw and the way that design flaw was executed. And uh, experts have said for years that, that that skywalk was inevitably going to collapse based on that design. Uh, it, it isn't clear whether the um, problem in Florida is related to design, some people suggest it is, or if it's just poor maintenance or the lack of maintenance, which is a different issue. So in that way, they're different. But the idea is that we believe somehow that the buildings we go into are safe because they're inspected and routinely improved, and that just isn't the case, and that's something that probably your viewers should understand. And in conjunction with this 40th anniversary of the Hyatt disaster, Channel 9 is premiering a new documentary on the tragedy that will air next week. I can hear it in my head right now, 40 years later. All of a sudden, you heard this noise. Pop! The noise was just incredible, and the building shook. It sounded like a big tree limb cracking. I just remember hearing the crack. You can watch the documentary Tuesday at 9 on KMBC. Michael Mahoney, you are a big part of that documentary. You were there at the hotel at the time. As, Mike, as uh, Dave Helling said, the cause of the skywalk collapse was structural overload resulting from design flaws. Was anyone ever held criminally liable for what happened? Not criminally liable, no. The uh, prime designer on it, a man by the name of Jack Gillum, had his uh, engineering license uh, stripped as a result of the errors that were made in that. There were dozens and dozens of civil lawsuits. There were dozens and dozens of out-of-court uh, out settlements on, on, on that. Um, but there were no criminal uh, charges filed in connection to it. There's almost nobody that was in Kansas City that didn't know someone who was there or knew someone who was there or knew of somebody who knew somebody. And so it turned into a big, small town in terms of dealing with the grief of, uh, of this. And Kansas City did a sort of Kansas City thing and tried to bury it for a while in, in at least not acknowledge, well, this was terrible and we need to need to de uh, deal with it. But uh, my colleague uh, Haley uh, Harrison has done a, an astonishing job of uh, uh, doing what I think might be the definitive uh, doc uh, on, on the high. And you can see that on ago. Channel 9, your station on KMBC, Tuesday night at 9 o'clock. From one disaster to possibly another, just a few miles down the road from us in Springfield, Missouri, hospitals are asking for ventilators and shipping patients out because they are overwhelmed by COVID cases. Now, this is a program that tries to put things in proportion, not try to elevate your blood pressure for the sake of it. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how concerned should we be about this? If there's no room for patients in Springfield, are they coming here to our Kansas City hospitals, Kat? Yeah, we do have some patients coming to this area to kind of relieve some of that burden on the health system down there. You know, the CEOs of the health systems in Springfield have talked a lot about how quickly this ramped up and how they weren't prepared because, I mean, the numbers tripled in, in a matter of weeks. Uh, it is concerning, though, because Missouri remains a, a hot spot for this Delta variant. And so you are, you know, you worry about the folks who are not vaccinated in the Kansas City metro um, getting 
seeing Delta variant and spreading it. Uh, so I think that people should be keeping an eye on this and keeping their precautions going, even if they are vaccinated. But as the vaccination rate is so much higher in Kansas City, though, uh, that means that we're not going to see as many hospitalizations. So aren't there going to be beds available, even if we are bringing in all of those folks from rural parts of Missouri? Dave Helling? Kansas City is well vaccinated, but it doesn't have herd immunity, not even close. And I can tell you that the um, I talked with folks at the Kansas City Health Department yesterday, and we're writing on this. Uh, people should start thinking, even vaccinated people again, about wearing masks in social settings, maybe in the workplace. There's no real impetus to force that on people. But the health people that you talk to are saying, hey, this thing is pretty dangerous. It could get out of hand. And even if you're vaccinated, you need to think about protecting yourself for the rest of the summer and into the fall. And we'll be hearing Dave more. Uh, by the now. way, we'll be hearing more from our fifth panelist, your cat, Dave Helling, a little later in this program. Cat Reed. Oh, I was just going to say, I thought that I was the only cat allowed on this panel today, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> that is very cute. Yes, Mike. I don't know how to follow that, okay. uh, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> it is going to be very interesting to see how the Parson administration deals with this. And Governor Bar Parson is indicating he's not, uh, he's not interested in federal folks being in there going door to door offering vaccines. He's not even interest interested in a big million dollar lottery like some sta states are. Watch how the Parson administration handles it. Yeah, and he was on uh, doing an interview yesterday in Jefferson City where he said we had a stockpile of ventilators. You know, a lot of people are saying they don't have a lot of ventilators. He's saying they've got a stockpile of them. Uh, who's on first? Yeah, I'm, on I'm, first? I'm, can I just quick, yep. quickly, Nick? If you need more ventilators, you have failed. I mean, ventilators are the last resort for COVID patients. So to say, hey, we've got plenty of ventilators begs the question, why do you need them? And you need them because the vaccination rates in Missouri are low, as Michael points out, because social distancing and masks were always voluntary in Missouri. If, when the Delta variant or any other variant comes back, that's what you need to fight and not on the back end when people get sick. You know, a sizable number of beds this week are being taken up by patients of a different sort. 20 people were sent to the emergency room at KU Hospital just for fireworks injuries alone. And then there were the victims of violence in just over a three hour period on Independence Day. 11 people reported shot in Kansas City in separate uh, incidents, including one losing their life outside of the police headquarters. It comes as a new national survey finds that concern over crime is now at its highest level in 20 years. According to an ABC News Washington Post poll, 55 percent of Americans think increasing funding for police departments would reduce violent crime. Is that changing Mayor Quinton Lucas's perspective, Eric? Uh, probably not. And I think his thing is the money that we're giving the police department, let's see if we can't find a better way to use it more effectively. I think that's the bottom line of what uh, this lawsuit and what their move was, that's what it's all about. Are we spending the millions, to hundreds of millions of dollars in an effective manner? Michael. There is an um, old saw in uh, public administration that the safest places are not the places that are filled with cops. The safest places are places where the economy is strong. That is one of the keys to this. It's not just more cops. He's never said anything about it publicly, but a, n a number of well-heeled Kansas Cityans have received an invitation to a private re-election fundraiser this week for Mayor Quinta Lucas. Contributions at the $3,500 level will buy you special access at the evening event at the Carriage Club. So being newly married with a new baby and one headache after another from crying to funding the police cat, that didn't convince the mayor that, you know, I, I don't need this anymore. No, you know, I think he feels there's unfinished business. And I think one of the issues um, that he really needs to tackle still is the issue of violent crime and seeing the numbers go up year after year. So I think um, he sees that there's more to do. And, you know, we also think about the, the U.S. Senate seat that's going to be open and the race for that. Um, he had considered that. But at the end of the day, 
watching uh, Democrats run statewide is pretty sobering. And I think that that um, has really pushed anyone away from jumping into that opportunity. And and that's why, you know, we don't think he's considering that. No chance he's running for it. No chance he was seriously considering it. It was a trial balloon at best uh, from his, his, his press shop. And he still enjoys getting quoted on it. Are you running? And his answer is still, well, I'm thinking about it. He's not doing that. And I think the worst kept secret in the world would be that a first term mayor in Kansas City uh, was, is considering reelection. Of course, he's considering reelection. I want to hear what Dave Helling's cat has to say about that. It <laughs> Let me just say quickly that I think the more fascinating story about Quentin Lucas will be if he faces um, anything other than token opposition for a reelection. I think it's almost certain that one of the Northland council members will run for mayor. Uh, it might be Dan Fowler, might be Teresa Lohr, might be Heather Hall, might be more than one uh, uh, seeking to replace. Uh, Mayor Lucas, and that may be why he's raising money now, because he realizes his reelection will not be a slam dunk as it was, for example, for Kay Barnes uh, or Sly James. Eric, are you hearing about anybody who is privately working the phones trying to raise money to run against Quinton Lucas at this moment in time? Actually, I have heard about one person that... Just between somebody... us, who is that? <laughs> I can't say. I was sworn to secrecy. Oh. But, uh, you know, the call, we already endorsed Quentin now for a number of reasons. We endorsed early in that race. So you, you've, already, you've already endorsed him? That, that election won't take place yeah. until 2023. Anything can yeah. happen. There could be huge scandals, and you would still have endorsed him? I, I, now, I did leave the door open, minus something him doing that's totally off the wall. But I think that, you know, he has handled things with the pandemic, uh, contrary to what other people might think. I believe that he handled that situation extremely well. We could have had a lot more deaths here in Kansas City than we did. So, Michael. I also think that there will be a serious challenge to Quentin Lucas. I'm not sure it's going to be any of the four members of the city council. In fact, I doubt it. But I do think there's going to be an effort that stems from north of the river to mount a serious campaign against Quentin Lucas. And the uh, police budget issue is going to be the center point of that campaign, at least right now. So, And if you, you know, think about this week, we had a former police captain win the Democratic primary to be the next mayor of New York City. So you could even have a law enforcement component uh, to a race against. Now, there was uh, some discussion, Nick, mayor. of Nathan Garrett being a mayoral candidate, right. you know, the police board member. But, of course, he's moved out of Kansas City now, so he would not be eligible to run uh, uh, living in Smithville. But Mike is right. There will be some effort, and I do think it will be Northland-based. The only reason I mention, I mention council members is that some of them are term limited, and so their service on the council will come to an end, and they may look at the mayor's race as their only way to continue that. So we'll see what happens, but I do think that Mayor Lucas, unlike, say, other recent mayors, will face a serious challenger in two years. Now, while that race for Kansas City mayor is still some time away, in Overland Park, voters are going to be heading to the polls in, to pick a new mayor in a matter of weeks, and the race to succeed Carl Gerlach is already getting ugly. Did you see the Police are now getting involved with back and forth accusations of sign stealing by campaign staffers, no less. Officers now pouring through CCTV footage in a search for the culprits. We don't want this to be a war between signs. We want this to be a competition between ideas. Now, I do find this interesting because I've heard it said on this program more than once that the number of yard signs a candidate has doesn't make any difference whatsoever. So if they don't make a difference, why do some campaigns resort to stealing them then, Michael? Because they don't know any better. Uh, <laughs> I am one of these folks that believe that uh, yard signs are uh, misleading. Uh, yes, you've chastised me on that several times on this program. I try, I try to protect you by not mentioning your name. I, and I, well, oh, okay, and so you're going to hide your sources as well as Eric just did, right? <laughs> I got it. Um, it's petty little juvenile uh, pranks like this that uh, a sign, sign stealing that really irritate candidates and really irritate their, their 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 most loyal supporters. But I don't think I would read much into it. 
And Michael used the word juvenile. I think, in fact, that these were minor volunteers who may have been implicated in this. At least that's what the candidate said. So I think that these may have just been kids who are volunteering who um, who pulled this stunt. Okay, we're going to be talking more about this race, by the way, and the race for mayor of Wyandotte County, which is also happening. Uh, and we, as we get closer to election day in August. Speaking of elections, the Fourth of July holiday has traditionally marked the start of campaign season. Hello, everyone. In case you've forgotten, I'm Bob Dole. Many of us were still picking up our spent fireworks. Former Kansas Senator Bob Dole and recently retired Senator Pat Roberts make a big splash as they put their thumb on the scales in the Kansas governor's race. The two veteran Republicans announced they're endorsing Kansas Attorney General Derek Schmidt for Kansas governor. Now, of course, they weren't going to endorse Laura Kelly. She's a Democrat. But what about Jeff Collier, who fancies himself back in the governor's mansion? Is this a death blow to him, Dave Helling? Or do more Kansas Cityans care about a Salvi splash than a Dole and Roberts double splash? this week? Well, uh, it will have some impact among some Republicans, but I don't think in a primary setting, Nick, it will be definitive. First of all, it came far too early. I mean, we don't, you know, we're not going to vote till next year. So the idea that Bob Dole and Pat Roberts might swing a large block of Republican voters to Derek Schmidt is probably unlikely. It will help him raise money. And Collier does have the support of sitting Senator U.S. or Senator Roger Marshall, as well as U.S. Rep. Tracy Mann. So he has those endorsements. Um, I think that the timing is interesting. I think that they want to prevent um, a bloody primary. You saw what happened, um, you know, back in 2018 with the Republican primary. I think that's why these announcements came this early, but there's still a lot of runway left in the race. By the way, uh, Laura race. Kelly, governor, did get a huge boost this week herself. I mean, they noticed that all of the tax revenues were coming in. Money is now coming in hand over fist in Kansas. Doesn't that put it in a better position, even though we've been told that she has very little chance of re-election, Dave? Well, it's not. It's better than a poke in the eye with a <laughs> stick. I mean, you you know, any governor would like to have a surplus of that size. But let me just say, it sets up a real battle next year, Nick, uh, because the legislature, the Republicans, will almost certainly go for a major tax cut uh, and claim that the that the Topeka has far more money than it needs, and she will resist that. She wants to spend money on a lot of different uh, projects in Kansas. That will be the significant political battle, I think, in 2022. Also on the political front in Kansas this week, Chris Kobach making a splash as he wins the endorsement of former Missouri governor and U.S. Senator John Ashcroft. In fact, Ashcroft pumped Kobach, saying his experience and skill as an attorney are among the best in the nation. Kobach is running to become the Kansas Attorney General with such high praise for his legal skills. Why did Kobach draw an opponent this week as State Senator Kelly Warren from Leewood files against him, Michael? Because there is a belief inside of the Republican Party that Chris Kobach cannot win statewide, and they point to the governor's race as a, uh, a example of that. They'll counter and say, well, he won statewide as Secretary of State. It's a very different race as governor. Now, down ballot, his AG is also a very different race. But there is a feeling inside of the Republican Party in Kansas that Chris Kobach brings more trouble to them in an electoral sense than he does a benefit. And just quickly, Nick, anyone who thinks Kelly Warren is the moderate alternative to Chris Kobach in that primary is mistaken because she is very, very, very conservative very far to the right of her party. So that sets up a rather interesting, if that's the field, an interesting primary for that spot. Now, we've been told that cats have nine lives. We can ask Dave Helling's cat about that. But how many lives does the cat's drugstore building have? You may remember several key council members said there was no way they would have any tax incentives to turn the former drugstore into luxury apartments, especially when it was located on one of the hottest stretches of real estate in the entire metro alongside the new streetcar route down Main Street. In fact, the city council killed off the plan last week. But guess what? Like Jason in the horror film Halloween, it just won't die. The plan has been revived. Dave Helling, I thought this council was dead set against throwing out handouts to developers. That money should oh, be oh, no, no, targeted no, no, no. to blighted areas. No, 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 no. They hand out uh, uh, incentives like candy to the Strata building, the Waddell and Reed building. I can go on and on, and there is an effort to revive this one. Now, whether or not they can find a bridge to get to an incentive package for this proposed uh, apartment uh, project and cat's restoration uh, project remains to be seen because I do think a majority of the council wants to see more from the developer, including more affordable housing units in that project and perhaps some parking. 
And the developer to date has said, well, no, we just can't make the numbers work. But, but you know, as, as you pointed out, and as we pointed out, there's always an effort to try and save these things. And that effort is now underway down at 12th and up. It's interesting also, Eric, this is coming at a time when we're now in this coming out of a pandemic and states and cities are seeing a huge influx of cash coming in. Uh, wh why do they need to give incentives at all at this point in time when they are flush with cash? They don't. Uh, the developers really don't need it, but they kind of want, it's one of those situations where they want everybody to have some skin in the game. Uh, and so developers are saying, well, we'll do this and we're going to bring this tax base to the city where people will be paying taxes and people will move in. They'll go to the grocery store and they'll spend money and the, the local municipalities will, will receive proceeds from that. But at the bottom line is, these guys are millionaires. They're making millions. They're going to make even more millions. Why do they need the incentives? Okay. Michael. It's going to be a very tough sell. If they would provide a, a an affordable housing component in it, they might have a shot of warming up some uh, of the hearts of City Hall. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't appear to be that that's going to be a path they follow. No, speaking of incentives, just before we finish, Waddell and Reed got nearly $100 million in local and state tax subsidies to build a brand new 18 story headquarter building downtown. In March, the company announced, well, it was no longer moving in after being bought by an Australian firm. Did the city get its money back, Dave? Well, that's a very complicated question, and the answer is no. Uh, if because there are incentives, it's not like a cash outlay, but we still lack, to my knowledge, a permanent tenant. And that means that the financing is going to be fascinating to watch going forward. And I'm assuming a lot of people are not wanting to go to these big high rise buildings anymore, uh, Kat Reed. Yeah, I think the pandemic completely changed the map on all of these projects. And uh, it will be very interesting to see if a company does step up and say that they are interested in uh, moving into this building when so many of their employees have the opportunity to work remotely. And on that, we will say our week has been reviewed. Thank you to Kat Reed from 41 Action News, on call from the Kansas City Call, Eric Wesson, and from the pages of your Kansas City star, Dave Helling, and his cat. And you can see Michael Mahoney Tuesday night at 9 as KMBC presents its new documentary on the 40th anniversary of the Hyatt Hotel disaster. I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us at Kansas City PBS, be well, keep calm, and carry on.